This episode of the Julian Dion Comedy Hour podcast is brought to you by Echo One Photography. Are you in the greater Toronto area and looking for some headshots or really any photography needs fulfilled? Well, look no further. Echo One Photography does it all from headshots for actors and comedians to corporate headshots, even social and dating website profile pictures. That's right. Don't take a selfie. Get it done by a professional. Increase those odds. They'll do it all. Product photography for your business, for e-commerce and advertising purposes. Once again, Echo One Photography does it all. Email Eugene at EchoOnePhotography.com today. That's Eugene, E-U-G-E-N-E, at Echo One, number one, Photography.com. Enter J-D-C-H in the subject line. Message to my mom. Message to my mom. This is a message for my mother, who is now on Facebook and online, so may very well have stumbled upon this podcast. So mom, if you're listening, let me first say that I love you very much. You're a great mom, always have been and continue to be to this day. And secondly, let me ask you to please not listen to this podcast. You know, this is a comedy podcast. It's uncensored. I interview comedians and other creative, fascinating, interesting people, so I don't have any control over what's said. We might discuss some not-so-tasteful topics and have some salty language peppered in there, so you might not like what you hear. So please, I beg you, if you're listening, please turn it off. You know, they say to truly become a great artist, you can't care what other people think of you. And that really begins with your parents. You cannot care what your parents think about your output to truly reach your full potential. So I ask you, Mom, please let me be great by not having to think in the back of my mind that you're listening to this. And if you do choose to listen, just know that I love you very much. Message to my mom. Again, episode number four, coming at you from Lemon Press Studios in the Distillery District, downtown Tirana. Tirana. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. It's the Julian Dion Comedy Hour podcast. What's going on? What are you saying? What's shaking? How you doing? Good. I'm good. Oh, you didn't ask me? Oh, my bad. That's selfish. You should have asked. Because I asked you. That's how it works. I ask, you ask back, even though we don't really care. I do. I, I do care. I take that back. I care. Oh, I am tired. It's early in the morning, Tuesday, September 30th. It's really early. Like 6.38 a.m. early. Uh, I'll get into that in a bit, but uh, first, let me welcome you back. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the first three episodes. Getting some good numbers, getting some good feedback. Email the show, pod, P-O-D, at jdcomedyhour.com. I want to hear from you. I'm starting a an email segment. I'm going to read some emails. Yeah. Shit, yeah. All right? So that's where you come into play. Send me a little... Drop me a little line, and I'll, uh, I'll, uh, j- oh, I was trying to rhyme there, but I couldn't think of anything because it's early. 
Oh, and uh, subscribe on iTunes. If you're listening to this on an iPhone, hopefully it's not bending. Hopefully it's not a new bendy iPhone, which I think is a hoax now. They've confirmed. But uh, if you are listening on an iPhone, go on iTunes, subscribe and rate and comment that shit. Ratings and comments boost the ratings. Can I say ratings more? And um, it sort of uh, gives us exposure. All right. I need that shit. Hit that shit. Okay. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. How's your weekend? Did you have a good weekend? Why don't you just, if you're driving right now, just say it out loud. Hit pause. Just talk about your weekend to yourself as if you're talking to me and then come back. I'll give you a second. All right, good. That's a good weekend. That was fun. That's busy, but good. I mean, it's good to be busy and uh, that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. I am freakishly tired because I'm a procrastinator. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Tuesday morning. I should have released this episode at midnight technically, but I've been procrastinating with things that matter that have no importance really as far as my career or anything goes. I've sort of the podcast is a priority, but for some reason, I've had till Friday to record a little intro here, and I, I still, it's Tuesday morning, and this is what I, like, I'm productive, but I'm unproductive, because I'll do things that serve me no purpose, but aren't that bad, like, I'll spend, like, three hours reorganizing my iTunes folder, or my emails, but I won't send an email for my career or record an intro for my podcast until last possible second. I also ruined my, uh... I think I ruined it. I'm not sure. My Nutribullet. Yeah, I'm one of those guys. I have a Nutribullet. I, I like smoothies. I love smoothies. Who am I kidding? I love them. And uh, smoothies make me happy. I want to see that in a t-shirt. That's two t-shirt suggestions in four episodes. One was, uh, I think it's it's cozy in the past or something. Anyway, let's... I, uh, I I started uh, making a shake this morning, a little smoothie action before coming here in a stupor. I'm exhausted. I'm on about four hours sleep. And I didn't tighten the lid uh, like all the way. I didn't tighten it enough. And uh, I left the room while I let it nutribull. <laughs> Is that how you say it? Nutribull? Nutribull it? I'm letting it nutribull? Nutribullize? Anyway, and I came back in and uh, there was just shit everywhere. Shake. Little uh little smoothie inside the machine. Why do they ha- why did I have to make it that you have to pour the- put the thing upside down to If you're listening to this Nutribull people, Nutribullites, email me. Don't email me. Well, you can email me. Yeah, actually do email me. <laughs> And uh, ruined, I think it's ruined. I had to, like, wash it. And I don't think you should be watch it, washing electronic parts, but I did. And now it's in my apartment drying off. So I'm going to try to turn it on later, but I think uh, I'm scared of getting electrocuted. Anyway. So I've been procrastinating, and here I am way tired and usually I'd be sleeping but I figured I had to do this so I set my alarm ruined my Nutribullet and came right over to Lemon Press Studios where I sit now I procrastinate I do I watch TV a lot and even though the whole time I'm watching TV I'm thinking of other shit I should be doing I just sit there and I watch and bad TV I mean just the weirdest shows I'm a big Coronation Street fan. I love Coronation Street, which is hard to find anyone under the age of 68 that loves it. But uh, if you if you do like it, hit me up. Let's bond on that. I want to hear that. Let's exchange Coronation Street stories. It's uh, it's it's saucy right now. 
I never thought I'd like it, but I got into it by I watched a few episodes. You have to you have to watch like give it a chance. Give it about 18 episodes and then you're in deep. There's like an 18 episode arc to get hooked on that show, but once you're in, it's been on the air for like 54 years. And I love it. It's so soothing to watch that show. It's just like It's just like there's no there's a whole world on one street. There's a whole uh, economy uh, they don't no worries there's really no worries on coronation street if you if you have a job and you don't like it you quit your job and i'm go work at the shop across the street and you, that was my brutal british accent and they go across the street and they get a job working at the shop there's no no concern for labor costs or s- previous skill sets or experience you just get that job at the shop or at the gym or at the bistro Nick's Bistro, he changed it to just Nick's in his divorce. And he's in the middle of a divorce with Leanne. It's heated. Check it out. Coronation Street. It's soothing. It's relaxing. Oh, yeah. We've all heard that song when you're sick as a kid from school. Instantly, you change the channel. But now, I, I... I fill up with glee. I'm such a huge fan of Coronation Street. Every time I see a British person or anyone from the UK, I freak out. I'm like, oh my God, you're from the UK. Coronation Street, right? They're usually like, no, that's a terrible show. That's the same as if someone from the UK came here and they were like, oh, you're Canadian. That's amazing. Arctic Air, right? Am I right? You watch Arctic Air? Arctic. Arctic Air. That's on the CBC, huh? Or it would be more like, Hello, you uh, you watch Arctic Air? Bringing you accents this morning, ladies and gentlemen. The Real L Word. I've watched that. Here's the thing that happened. I actually, The Real L Word is a reality TV show on lesbians in California. It should be, it could basically be called 30 minutes of softcore scissoring. Which hey, do your thing, please, and film it. I'll watch it. Uh, I've this is I, I've actually cried watching the real L word. I'm a grown man. There's no joke there, but it's just that's a real fact that happened. I cried. They had this wedding. These two Girls were getting married, and it was, you know, they're leading a movement, and it was powerful. And I found myself tearing up, actually. Again, no joke there, but I know there's just, that's, that really happened. I'm, I was getting ready for my day. It was the morning, too. I was eating cereal, fully dressed, fully clothed, crying, watching the real L word. Check that shit out. I just watch weird TV. The Biggest Loser, which I'm convinced is the worst show on TV. But I somehow watch it. I don't watch it religiously, but I do on occasion. And I don't know why I watch it. It's got to be one of the worst shows on TV because it talk about taking advantage of people. It's really capitalizing on sick people. And the sicker, the better. Every year, every season, they're like, this season, our biggest contestant yet. It's like 800 pounds. Oh, my God. Yeah, tune in. And they always have crazy backstories. like, dead family. Please give me a dead family on there. Always one person with where they lost their entire family to something horrible, which is why they're, they're overweight and they get into it. And that's what hooks us in, right? That's what we like. We like desperation. We like shows like, the Biggest Loser or Intervention or Hoarders. Oh, my God, that makes us feel better about ourselves, doesn't it? Doesn't it? But I think The Biggest Loser is the worst possible show. They just capitalize on it. It's a giant mach- money-making machine. They're constantly advertising... You know, the commercials, when you're watching Biggest Loser, the Biggest Loser the commercials are for Biggest Loser products. Exercise DVDs and protein bars and shakes, smoothies. 
Don't ruin your Nutribullet. And, uh, you know, exercise equipment. Get your t-shirt. Get your Biggest Loser t-shirts and clothes. I, I don't even know if that's a thing, but it's crazy. And they're like a, a, a sixth way of the way through the a season. They're advertising the next season. Just making money. This season, the first one-ton human. And it's just shaming. They shame the people. For one season, they had these public weigh-ins where they would bring each contestant that made the show into, like, a public forum in their own town, like in a, in a high school football field. They packed the stadium with, with uh, locals. And they'd get the person to get on a scale in front of everyone. Yeah, that's healthy. Let's fuck that person up even more. They, they could sure use that. That'll help them. That'll encourage them. Hey, let's get uh, the neighbors and uh, your in-laws to see how much you weigh publicly. Oh, and by the way, before you step on that scale, why don't you take that shirt off? Yeah. Let it all hang out. As if in front of your own town wasn't enough. No, no, we're going to actually, we're going to air this on national TV. Yeah. Millions of people. There might be some Canadian guy in Toronto crying over it. Who knows? Over cereal. Dead family. Love it. I don't know how they pick those contestants, but for some reason they always pick one or two people that can never compete in any of the physical challenges. If you if you watch The Biggest Loser, you'll know what I mean. They'll be like, all right, our first... And our first challenge, we're going to have to walk or run a mile. And Bob, unfortunately, you're not medically cleared to perform this task, so you will be... Doing jazzercises in the pool. I don't know. But there's... Why are you on the show if... And right away, right out of the gate, they're not medically cleared to do anything. And here's the here's another bad element of the show. They make it a competition so people get disappointed no matter how much weight they lose. First of all, they say it's healthy to lose one pound a week. These guys here lose 15, 20 pounds... But they make it a competition, so if someone will step on the scale, they'll lose six pounds and start crying because they've disappointed their team. It's like, you lost six pounds. Be happy about it. But because of the show format, they'll see the, the you know, that's the uh, scale. It jump, jumps around numbers, and then it lands on the number, and then it shows how much they've lost, and it, they get disappointed. Start crying. Why? Why are you crying? What are you? What are you feeling in there? That's the host. What are you? Why are you crying over there? You know. I just, I feel like, I've let my team down. You lost six pounds. Just be happy. You're still alive. You're going in the right direction. The best is when they lose a lot of weight. Some all of a sudden they become these super confident motivational speakers. You've lost 18 pounds. Congratulations. How do you feel? Well, I have to say that on uh, on this journey, I've been on this journey now for six weeks and I just have found myself and I've really learned to love myself and, and really find me. And I've never put myself before. I used to put always other people before me and and I realized it's important to love you. I've been... This is my destiny. I've been on this journey to find my destiny. This journesty, if you will. Motivational. I like when they walk up to a uh, challenge. They always give, give their perspective. I walk up to this challenge and I see zip lines. Now... I don't do zip lines regularly. Yeah, no shit you don't do zip lines. I don't mean to sound insensitive, by the way. I just... I don't know. I think it's a bad show. I think... I just think if you want to lose weight, 
There are other ways. Why have to? Why do it through shame and exposure on TV? Anyway. Let's get to my guest today. I had a nice chat with a buddy of mine, great comedian, Mr. Graham K. He's accomplished a lot in his short amount of time doing stand-up. Very, very funny gentleman. We had a, a good chat about his days in New York and, and coming back to Canada. He started comedy in New York. He's originally from Ottawa, but he started in, in, in Canada. I notice I do that. I add D's or, or f in places that I shouldn't. Like, I just did Ind. I just said Ind. Anyway. And uh, we also do a fun Mariah or Yoko segment with Jen Grant and Graham K. So uh, check that out, and here's uh, enjoy my chat with Graham. Today's episode is also brought to you by HP Audio. Toronto listeners, here's another one for you. Contact HP Audio today for any DJ services for your wedding, for your private event, for your corporate function, for your corporate luncheon. That's right, luncheon. Contact HP Audio today for your elaborate audio installs and setups. Don't try to do it yourself. That never ends well. Contact the professionals at HP Audio. Email djhpaudio at gmail.com. That's djhpaudio at gmail. Dot com. Enter once again JDCH in the subject line. You and me below, just like the flowers, laughing all day long. People, I need to lose. Sing a little song, then take a shower. Julian Dion, comedy. My friend, uh, my friend doesn't have a, a lot of money. My friend doesn't have a lot of money, but he, uh, he, he smokes like a pack of cigarettes a day, right? It's expensive. My friend's like, why doesn't he quit? Why? It's so expensive. I was like, yeah, because he's addicted. It's clinically proven that smoking cigarettes is ju just as addictive as heroin. But you would never say that to a heroin addict. They'd be like, hey, stinky Steve. <laughs> Why don't you quit heroin? <laughs> so expensive. <laughs> What's he gonna be like? Oh yeah, thanks. Thanks for mentioning that. Actually, it's funny you say that. I was just running uh, my finances through Quicken. And uh, yeah, see this pie chart is actually uh, heavily skewed towards heroin. It's almost all heroin. It's a small sliver for food. Rest crippling, crippling heroin addiction. So thank you, friend, for that sound financial advice. Okay, that is, of course, uh, of course, of course, my guest today. He's a uh, new podcast, right? The new podcast. Yeah, just getting getting the words <laughs> out, getting learning the, the words, learning it. We'll that was it. my guest today. My guest did. He's a great comedian. Great guy all around. He's done a lot in a relatively nice. short uh, amount of time you've been doing it. I mean, not not, not that long. He's won the uh, coveted uh, Homegrown competition at the 2013 Just for Laughs Comedy Festival. He was a finalist at the 2013 Seattle Comedy Contest. He's been to the Halifax Comedy Festival. He's a co-host of the Sports Bras uh, podcast, which is on XM, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and also... I think his best credit. He's done the Being Frank show twice, oh ladies and God. gentlemen. Oh my God! Yeah, I've actually done twice, it three times. But that's easy. Three to times. Miss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I uh, they give you uh, what they give me a uh, free. It's down the street from my house. I got free breakfast, delicious breakfast, like a gourmet breakfast uh, with red wine um, in the morning, and then I got a uh, hundred and fifty dollar gift certificate at a really good restaurant run by mobsters where they hired really good chefs, even though no one was there. Boom. So, like, I would, like, uh, you know, take dates on coupon dates. Or, like, I'd be in the neighborhood and I was, like, with buddies and be like, let's just get 
super drunk. I got these. I got like $150 we can just get, you know, pre-drink at, you know. Show business. Yeah. You've, you've arrived. When you've done the Being Frank show three times, that's it. Can I tell right you, here. you know, if you don't know the Being Frank show, guys, it is a show where a um, a rich guy um, bought, an, he, he's the son of like a, uh, like a big food company. He's like, he inherited this big food company and he bought an hour of advertising space and created his own late night TV show. And every commercial is for his juice company. Yeah, and he'll have commercials of his juice company. Then he'll have a commercial of him cooking something that yeah. looks awful. Looks dude. He's like, <laughs> he's like uh, cooking these frozen, uh, this frozen pasta. And he adds these, and it looks disgusting. Like yeah. the the key to making a good food commercial or show is you got to make it really nice and presentable, and sure. like you want to eat it. It's just like a, a pile of shit <laughs> on a plate. Uh, so Graham K. Yeah, is my guest today. You've done a and, lot. Uh, You've done so much. You've done a lot. How long have you been doing stand-up? About eight years, I'm guessing? Uh, the same seven. Time? Seven? Well, 2007 is when I started to really... I think I did like 10 open mics, and then in 2007, I was like, let's do it. Uh, and you started... So you're originally from Ottawa. That's right. But you went the uh, opposite route, where you started comedy in New, York, in New York City, if I'm correct. I'm so excited that I can actually tell my story, because I got my visa. I don't have to worry about... Some oh yeah, government right. official listening right. to this. You just I, got your O one. Yeah. Congrats. That's so yeah, I, I went to. Um, I started in. I did like maybe, probably like five open mics over, five six years in Ottawa, and then I, uh, I got a summer job in New York, and then I was like, I'm just gonna try and I did, I think I had like a really good set at Absolute Ottawa, which is the most juiced easy room like you. Yeah. Could, you could literally burp into a microphone and destroy. Great club. Yeah. For that. For that. And then I and I was like, okay, well, I'm I'm so good. I'm ready for Letterman. I'm gonna go to New York. <laughs> so and did you have so why New York? Were you were you just had this aspirations of doing stand up there? Because that was the reason I went. I just had this romantic idea of doing comedy there for yeah. even before I ever started. I'm like, I just want to do stand up in New York. What brought you there? I got a summer job illegally at a uh, at the head office of a uh, rich Jewish summer camp, and it was a summer job um, doing logistics. I had done some logistics previously for the Canadian government, so that sort of was how I got it. And then I got fired because I sent the I sent like a a kid to like the wrong city in Italy. And um, wait, what? How 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 does that happen? I'm not good at logistics. I just sort of like backed into that c- career in my early right. 20s. And um, I'm not an organized person. And I got confused and I sent like little uh, little Benji on the wrong flight. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened? He gets to the wrong city. He gets to the wrong city. And uh, what was where like, was he going? Was it like a... I forget. They were like going jet skiing off the coast of Italy. Like the team, like the whole group was. Like right. it was like a very rich camp, mm. uh, upstate New York. Uh, and um, yeah, I I uh, I sent one guy on the like the train. I, I bought the wrong ticket. There was a layover someplace, and then he ended up in the wrong place. And he <laughs> called his parents, and they were freaking out. And they called us, and they were like, "What the hell?" And I was like, "I sent him on the wrong right place." They're like, "Did you?" I was like, he must have gone on the wrong plane. <laughs> and we like, <laughs> scrolled through the emails and the tickets. And I was like, clearly, I just bought in the wrong thing. Oh, shit. And then I fell asleep in a meeting, and that was the last straw. And then I got fired. But I'd made just enough money. I made 800 bucks. The plan was only to stay for the summer for the duration of the right. summer job. It was in, uh, it was a, the summer job was like a half hour, 45 minute train ride from, from um, Grand Central Station. And uh, and I got I, at that point I had made eight hundred dollars, which was enough for my sublet for the remainder of the summer. And um, all I needed was food money, so I just started looking for a under the table job. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I'm really afraid that if I uh, if I say that, we'll edit that out. I'll be screwed. Uh, but anyway, I so it was I, an over the table job. I, so I looked for an over the table legal job, <coughs> officer, <laughs> and uh, um, I did that, and uh, I got like a, a, a job waiting tables in the the in Chelsea, which is the eighth and twentieth, which is I would argue the gayest intersection in the world. Per capita, mm, right. I would say. Because if you, all America's gay people move to the east or the west 
of America, East Coast or West Coast. Right. To New York or basically San Francisco. And um, in San Francisco, they run that town, so they're spread out. It's also a more spread out place, I gather. And um, Manhattan, they just all moved to Manhattan, and they all moved to one part of Manhattan. Yep. And the middle of that gay part of Manhattan is 8th and 20th, mm-hmm. where my restaurant was. Mm-hmm. And it was an eye-opener. In what way? Just because you came from conservative Ottawa? and No, just uh, I'd never gone to... I've never been to a place where... It, you know, just it's, so out in the it, open. It's, and it's strange if you're straight, and I've never got so much more respect for what women have to go through. <laughs> right, right. Men are so aggressive and creepy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they say the thing that uh, you know, gay like gay guys won't necessarily hit on straight men because they have, but that's not true at all. I'm working at a not a gay restaurant, but right. a gay run restaurant in a gay neighborhood. It's implied, and even if I'm not, I mean, I'm in on their territory. I mean, yeah. it's my fault. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like I really think that every guy should spend a couple weeks being a waiter in a gay neighborhood, and they will never harass women again. That's right. Yeah, that's a good point of view. I don't ever thought of that. Like I would be standing on the corner, and um, and I would just like I'm from from Ottawa, you know, just a friendly Canadian boy, and like you know, make eye contact with people. They smile at you. I'm gonna smile back. Sure, why not? And yeah. then they would cross the street and uh, just start touching me. Right. I'd be like, stop! Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> that, something like that sort of happened to me. I lived in Vancouver like way back in 2004, and I lived in the gay neighborhood, which I loved. It's safe. It's clean. It's like well decorated. Yeah. And um, my building was was uh, there was a lot of gay men living in my building, mm-hmm. and I, I same sort of thing where you make eye contact and smile. I went a step further, and there was a guy Had coming. Sex with a man. <laughs> I fucked a guy. It was yeah. it was actually what a step. It's not gay if you live in the gay neighborhood no. and you're straight. No, <clears throat> it's like a girl making out with another girl in college. Exactly. Yeah. That's that version. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I held the elevator for the guy, but it was like on my part, sort of aggressively nice because he was still between the two doors. You know, there's two doors sure. to the building. Yeah. He's in between there and he's got a bike and I'm in the elevator and the door's about to close. So I held it mm. for a long time, mm-hmm. like like a minute and a half. And yeah. he came and uh, he put his bike on the other side of us and he just had his face about two inches from mine and just stared at me with such love and yeah <laughs> adoration i don't know about love <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> zest maybe right. lust uh, yeah it, 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 and, it, and it really isn't like uh like obviously i'm not, I'm not trying to say i don't know we're trying to say like all gay people are like that no but no, if, of course not. if you move to that neighborhood it's because you're into the swinging lifestyle right. you know what i mean right. and then you're in the middle of all that so mm. it's kind of you know it's like you're flirting. It's not their fault. You're That's sending, right. I'm, we're sending mixed signals. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I went out of my way to hold the elevator. Like, clearly I had time to just make this connection with this guy. <laughs> and it could be construed that what I'm saying is all women who get harassed are sending mixed signals and it's all their fault. But that's, what I'm not, that's obviously not what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe it is. Mm. So you're in New York. You get the summer job. And when did you decide? Because how many years were you there? A couple of years? I was there um, five years. Five years, oh, yeah. holy shit. Yeah, yeah. one, like a summer turned into five years pretty quickly. And how it does that pretty happen? addictive li- living in that town, and then you start uh, yeah, progressing at comedy, making a crew of friends, and really getting addicted to the stage time and the talent around you, and, you know, so you just, yeah. you could see how it just it's turns a, it. There's an energy to it. There's a mm-hmm. hop to your step when you're there. You just feel like you're part of something. Like, mm-hmm. I never got over that fact. I, over, I felt like I was in a movie the whole time. Even I was there for almost three years, I guess. And I just looked around in awe still, like I, towards the end of it. I, I couldn't believe I lived there. But how do you make the transition? So you do stand up. You do a great set at Absolute, which is, again, no marker of anything, really, because it's always hot, hot crowds. How do you keep your confidence intact by going from that to New York, where you start to cut your teeth? Because how many sets have you done up until that point? Well, I, I had a... Uh, I mean, I probably did 10 sets before I moved to New York. Right. Yeah. And so how the fuck do you do that without freaking out or just... Packing well, it all in. You, you realize that you're new and that everyone else is new. And right. you just realize that all through your life, you thought you and your buddy were the funniest people. And right. you knew that you thought a different way. And other people were good at math. And 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 you were good at comedy. So you just have to... Uh, 
I guess, believe in yourself and, and I don't know, I was going through it with a lot of good people. And that's the thing. I think the key is what you said. You, you sort of understand and grasp the fact that you are new because people with experience go there and don't last because, you know, they come from a smaller town or city where they're, you know, the star comedian in that town. Then they go to New York where the best of every city, uh, everywhere moves yeah, I think I think that way was a big advantage for yeah. me because I didn't ha- I had no ego right. when I went there. I didn't. Right. I had no expectations. I expected to just you know eat poo mm-hmm. for the first few years. And so, did you do sort of like bringer rooms? How do you get into? I did. Uh, I did just run of the mill open mics where you it's f- you know twenty comedians. There's absolutely no audience, uh, and all the audience is comedians waiting to go on. And maybe you had to buy a drink to get that that spot, and maybe you had to even pay five dollars. Mm-hmm. Some of them were you had to pay five dollars. Yeah, pay to play. There was a few that were free. Those are always like forty comics, and you waited literally three hours to get on. Um, but after a while, you learn to like, time it out. You sign up for ones at a certain time, so you can sort of, you know, while you're waiting, you're also doing a spot across town, and then you come back like. Subway. That's why the New York's so great, like that. Everything's so tight. Mm-hmm. Also, I would, uh, and then how I learned. How, that's how I wrote, and then how I learned how to see if those things would work in front of real audiences. Is I barked, which means you, uh, you get a, a non-paying job at a comedy club or a room, and you um, basically stand on the street corner for two hours, handing out uh, flyers for that comedy club for like five minutes of stage time but it's five minutes of stage time in front of a real crowd and you can do it any night you want so i would do it four nights a week five nights a week right and how many hours do you have to bark to get five minutes like probably two hours i remember yeah. well, I, that's not bad i remember i i uh i worked i would do like what, like wednesday to saturday barking and then sunday monday tuesday i would uh I would do like heavy open mics. I was trying to perform like 10 times a week. Mm-hmm. If I get that 10 things. But the best was the weekends because I would do uh, a five minute spot on a weekend spot at Sal's Comedy Hall, which turned into CB's Comedy Club mm-hmm. and now is nothing. Uh, <laughs> but that was, I would do the early show and then I would have to bark for the middle show, which was the hot, hot show. But I would never, you weren't allowed to be on it if you were a barker. And then the last show, the late show, I would do. So I got to do two weekend spots, Friday and Saturday night. And I got friends with the bartender, so I drank for free. And it was like a party every night. And I was in Greenwich Village. And, yeah, yeah. You know, it's an excuse. Doing it. I was single. It was an excuse to talk to girls on the street and right. stuff. And I made friends. Like, people I was working with, you know, I was sort of friends with. And the pro comics I was super friends with because, you know, they, they liked me and I liked them. And so yeah. it was a good networking thing as well. Did you meet, did you meet a lot of women? You're a good looking guy. How was that Thanks. in New York? I uh, <clears throat> I yeah I had uh, I, New York is is like Tinder before Tinder. Right, right. I think that the rest of society is going to experience this now because of Tinder. Is right. people are not gonna get a girlfriend ever anymore mm. uh, because Ma- Manhattan, New York, is basically just. A playground for adults under forty who haven't had kids. Right. So if you're like even under forty five, like you haven't had kids, and you you know, <clears throat> so and everyone moved there after uh, college, university. Right. So there's no high school friends to mm-hmm. give you guilt trips. Right. Right. There's no family to give you guilt trips. There's not even any university friends, college friends right. to give you guilt trips. There's that anonymity. You can you're just like, do. yeah, you're like in summer camp yeah. the whole time you're there. Yeah. And then the people you meet are like, yeah, we're here to do this. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like you can't get a girlfriend because there's like there's another girl and then another girl. And right. then like same thing with girls. They're like, well, there's another guy. There's another guy. Right. There's another guy. And so it's like really fun when you're young and want to do that and then after like a few years you're like this is uh a never-ending uh it's like it's a, a hole that'll never be filled right well that's a gross pun but <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, shit. Uh, you know what i mean it, so, it just gets it gets like oh, c- can i meet somebody you know yeah yeah you know and then it you, gets old but do you have any good stories of like barking and picking up someone or, or I uh it it it, it um this is my form, like it's one of the things I'm like 
it's kind of cheesy talking about girls or whatever. Let's do it. But all, I'm all about the but cheese. But when, when I was, uh, I remember it was, I was standing on the corner handing out tickets, and then this beautiful woman, not like a girl, but like a woman, like it was walking down, and she had like a long dress on, and I think she might have been like pushing a stroller, had kids with, she had, I don't know, I think, and um. And I just looked up, and, and she was looking at me, and I was like, holy hala mama, you know, <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, and then she she walked up, and she's like automatically into me, which is awesome. Like that never, that's usually not the way, you know, you have to do some work, yeah, you know. And then, uh, and then uh, she's like gave me her number, and then for the rest of the summer on Saturday night, I would... Um, after I was done doing shows, I would go to her apartment and uh, she would smoke me up and then we'd make out. And then um, the next morning she'd make me breakfast and I had to leave because that's when her kids came over from her uh, dad's house. And she was like, <laughs> she was like this like fitness instructor. She was like a, the, um, yeah, she was like, had, she was on like a reality TV show. Mm. And, and I don't know. It was, uh, it was weird. And that's what's weird about being like, like also a, how it's like a, a like a pit you can't fill. Like towards the end of the summer, I was like, ugh, I do not want to do this anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like a dream yeah, come say, true. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, ugh, so boring. I have to go fuck this fitness and yeah. <laughs> Go have the best time of my life. <laughs> again. Hi, yeah. yeah. <laughs> again. Uh, yeah. that's great. Okay, so and what's your living arrangements? Are you living by yourself? Do you have roommates? Where are where are you living at this point? Um, I have a roommate with my girlfriend who I hope never hears this. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean in there in uh, New York at that point. Oh, I I was living in Bed Stuy, Brooklyn, in uh, the ghetto. There was like uh, Jay Z and Biggie Smalls are from there. The Marcy Projects are right, right around right. the corner. There were like gunshots all the time, and it's uh, there was an abandoned house beside us where mm-hmm. crackheads would go, and like and there was like a garbage dump that crackheads would like bring their like they would like get paid like sandwiches or like whatever to like the like the Hasidic Jewish people would pay them to take the construction and dump it in front of our house and then the and then the I remember the I lived with uh, like six other people by the way in this house crazy uh, and uh but it was close to everything that was cool you right, know what i mean right, if right. you just we just stayed in the house and then went on the subway it was fine mm-hmm. you know you could even walk to Williamsburg in like half an hour right. which was like it's like super trendy yeah yeah cool anyway but like we used to like we're like how do we get rid of that we'd call the the city and be like we can't you know the, there's a big garbage dump in front of, of construction and they never came never came the city would never come to that neighborhood and then we were like talking to locals we made friends with one guy uh, a couple people and they were like uh, yeah man if you want to get that garbage d- gun you just gotta light it on fire because the city has to take it if it's on fire so did you? Yeah, we every Shut like up. few months we'd have a garbage fire <laughs> in front of our place. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's huge garbage fire. So you're doing comedy ten a, times a week. Uh, you're trying to. You're mm-hmm. living in Bed Stuy, doing yeah. the the to and fro Manhattan. Mm-hmm. You're fucking a fitness instructor on the side. That's your side piece. Well, what, just, I mean, just I mean, for that was one. Right. Yeah. And. um do you, where do you fit a day job in there? You had to make money somehow. I, uh, I waited tables three days a week. I worked like I worked a double. I would work a Monday double, and then I'd do like like a Saturday Sunday brunch or whatever it was. Sometimes I'd work two doubles. Um, so I try. I probably work like five shifts a week. Mm-hmm. And for a while, for the first year, I was an intern at Vice Magazine. Also, so I was working seven days a week plus doing comedy, plus waiting tables and i had like a mental breakdown i just Mm -hmm. like i totally get what it's like when you almost have a nervous breakdown or do have a nervous breakdown right like i was my whole day i didn't had i had no sense of humor no personality and i was like just a zombie going from point a to point b and it was like i could just see my body moving like i was like a ghost watching my body it was weird super weird Mm -hmm. you just i had then i had to so i quit vice which was hard to do because it was so much fun. It was like, hey, you're new to New York. Here's the coolest parties. Yeah, yeah. You know? And um, and then I, it was better for me because I could focus on comedy more and, you know. So, do, yeah. do, do the thing. And the thing about 
performing in New York is you'll do any small show and the best comedians in the world will just so happen to be on that same show. They'll drop in, they'll do some time. So you get to watch that from a different perspective and sort of learn, which is great. You have a great Dave Chappelle story I'd like you to share um, with you, with with me. Sure, with you. With you. I'll share it with me <laughs> again. I like to hear it. Sometimes I wake <laughs> up and I share it with me. <laughs> hmm. You're doing well, Graham. Let's share it with you. <laughs> Again, new with the words. This is episode number four. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was uh, barking. I was like my first year of comedy, pretty much. Maybe I was like 12 months in, maybe a little bit more. And um, <clears throat> year and a half at the most, doesn't matter. Who cares? Uh, and I was on this Sunday show. I just barked for it. And there was like four of us that had barked. So they were going to, or like three of us that had barked or something like that. And plus the, the, so they had to go on plus the, the scheduled pro comedians that were, that were supposed to go on. And then Dave Chappelle walks in, <clears throat> he walks in, by the way, who's my hero. Mm-hmm. He still is. He's I, amazing. I would he's, say he's my all time favorite. Yeah. I could, I could say the same. He's just yeah. incredible. You watch him and you're like, how are you doing that? It's he's just, still amazing. He's still amazing. He's still doing it. Yeah. He's still coming up with great jokes. Yeah. He's like um, he's like a Cuban baseball player now. Mm-hmm. Like you don't like you hear about him. You're like he's good, but you don't hear no footage, nothing. Right. You know, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. just just w- w- word. Yeah. Oh boy. But anyway, um, so he walks in. This is after the Chappelle show had been canceled, or he quit the Chappelle show like maybe two years after. And he's got like his headphones on, no entourage, didn't show up in like a limo and nothing like that. He just walks in with like a backpack, headphones on. And he goes up to the. He knows the guy who who owns the club and and runs it. And he's like, "Hey, hey, man, can I get, can I do some time?" And they're like, "Yeah, Dave Chappelle." And by the way, there is like 15 people in the audience. Mm-hmm. And apparently, that's the place where he started the Boston Comedy Club. At that point, it was called the Comedy Village because it had changed ownership and it had really gone downhill. It was pretty much a dump, mm-hmm. and um, it's now a wine bar. <clears throat> but he. Uh, he was like, I hear it's closing. I want to do some time. Like, just where my old stomping grounds, where I started out, basically. And um, he, that's where I met Neil Brennan. They used to work the door together and stuff. Right. He co-created the Chappelle Show, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah co-created. And, 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 uh, and they're like, yeah, okay, cool. And then, you know, he still super, super fame. Maybe the height of his fame was when he walked in. And he gets on stage. place goes crazy. Everyone starts texting. It's, like, really before, like, smartphones. So everyone's, like, texting telling everyone and uh within i'm gonna say 20 minutes of him being on stage there's like a standing room only 120 people um, crazy and um and, and and one of the on my way there that day when i was barking i saw chevy chase with like some young woman you know hmm. and then so he's on stage and then you, you hear like heckling and Dave Chappelle's like, who's that? What did, what did you say? And he's like, I ate a dick, you know? And he's like, who's that? And he goes, and then someone goes, it's Chevy Chase. And he goes, what? Chevy Chase? And he stands up and he goes, that is, the, I'm getting heckled by Chevy Chase. <laughs> <laughs> Chevy Chase, one of the people who just heard, like, from, like, one of us, maybe, that, right. like, Dave Chappelle was in there. So he walked in and he started heckling him. And then, uh, anyway, so he's like, which is like totally a crazy New York moment. Mm-hmm. You know, I, like nothing, all of a sudden, Dave Chappelle's on stage getting heckled by Chevy Chase. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then, and then, and then uh, after like doing like 45 minutes to an hour, he's like, hey, uh, PJ, who's the, the runner, he goes, do you mind if I, uh, I, used to, I used to hate it when I, when I was waiting in the back of the room to go on stage and then Chris Rock would show up and just do a bunch of time and I'd be sitting there waiting to go on and be like, Fuck Chris Rock. He's like, do you mind if I host the rest of the show and bring up all the comics that were supposed to be on it? And so he brought up, so PJ made like a list and I was the only Barker that was put on that list. I think some pros didn't get on. I don't know why. Right. I mean, PJ didn't like me, mm-hmm. I didn't think, but that I was like, okay. And then I got on and and uh, I was like the second on and uh, he's like, you know, he didn't know who I was, but he just had like a list. And in between each comic, he would do like 40 minutes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and he, so after 40 minutes, Dave Chappelle, he's like, hey, uh, can I, okay, uh, welcome to the stage, uh, the house favorite, Graham. The house favorite, Graham. And he had like, there was a bass player downstairs, and mm-hmm. there was like a band playing at the bar downstairs, and he was like, 
and then every time it was silent, he'd be like, that's how you knew you weren't doing well. Come up here. You could hear the bass. And, he was, and then some girl goes, Boo! And, he, and he goes, what? And he goes, that's my boyfriend playing the bass. He's like, get him up here. And they brought up the bass player who left no his shit. concert and po- hooked, hooked his bass up into the thing. And he did like a whole back and forth. Oh, that's um, amazing. Which I want to believe is how he thought of the back of the fourth sequence on uh, the documentary Block Party. Right. Where he has like a back and forth with the band. Right, right. That happened before that documentary. And in, right. my, in my head, I'm like, that's... Why not? The sure. thing. Anyway, so he, um, he, uh, he, you know, I, I was like a year and a half, a year in or whatever, and I wasn't very good. Now, this is a long story. Anyway, he, uh, I did, I could hear like laughter from like the the back and i was like I, st- I started doing really well you know and uh and I, I i noticed the one of the laughs was dave Chappelle's laugh i was like i know that laugh i'm mm-hmm. like holy fuck holy fuck and um i i really only had like one or two jokes and the rest was just all like attitude right know? right yeah and and and, and then he he Took me off stage, and he and he went he went on. He was like, "Oh man, um, that joke you told about uh, you know your ex girlfriend crying, you know while while you were having sex is uh, an instant classic, you know. Uh, that's what comedy comes comes from pain. I haven't laughed that hard since I hung out with Chris Rock at Eddie Murphy's house. Crazy, right? I mean, he, that did not happen. I'm sure, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that he said that, totally. you know what I mean. And then and then then he did like another whatever eight hours of comedy and yeah. then brought on the next person and then got off stage and I'm just sitting there and he started walking towards me he's like oh jeez oh, oh my gosh <laughs> oh that's he's coming here <laughs> right to me and then he like sits down beside me I'm like he's sitting beside me he looks just like the movies <laughs> and he like grabs my the back of my head he's like he's touching me he feels like magic. And he grabs bat the back of my head and pulls me our temple to temple. And then he goes, I want you to know, you. and he's looking at me, you're sincerely talented. Sincerely. Sincerely, sincerely, sincerely talented. I mean that. And I was like, what? Like, like, I, looking back on it, I know that he probably didn't think that, but he n- knew what he was doing. He mm-hmm. knew that that, that I was new and that I was going to go through and in s- still some respects several years of complete shit getting punched in the dick every night and that little thing is enough to really keep you going for like 2 3 years yeah you know I mean, and you can dig that up anytime it yeah. keeps keeps you going yeah and 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 people say never meet your idols or whatever and I've had friends who have and they've been like greatly underwhelmed and he was just such, he was just the best. He's yeah. just the fucking best. I always thought that what he did on the Chappelle show was like, like leaving it was the most punk rock thing in the world. Mm-hmm. I didn't get, I, I, people call him crazy. And I always thought like America runs on like the cult of money, you know, right. that's the carrot on the stick to keep everyone going. And when you shun that, you're crazy. You're crazy. Yeah. That's what we're built on. You maniac. Yeah. You, you, you Marxist, you know, you're yeah. doing what you believe in instead of chasing the money. Right. And, and I already had that opinion of him, and for him to be so nice. And then he came back like two days later or something, and he remembered my name. You know, he's like, "Oh, hey, Graham, how you doing?" <laughs> I was like, "Whoa, oh, whoa, oh, oh. that's got to be." I mean, still- I got the vapors. <laughs> and, like, I passed out. <laughs> uh, an old timey like fan. Yeah. Um, to this day, it's got to be one of the, your highlights. I mean, oh, absolutely. That moment. Yeah. Like, it'd be hard to outshine that. It, it, and and that's yeah. It, yeah, yeah. It's like a I I I don't want to say a curse, but like it's like that one year in was like probably the highlight until something fucking crazy happens in my mm-hmm. career. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're gonna play a clip. Actually, we have that audio of that night uh, where uh, he he tells you. Yeah, don't play the middle part where I do comedy. <laughs> we'll just play the <laughs> no, end part where yeah, Dave Chappelle talks God. about Graham's yeah. set. Here it is. Please make some noise for the house favorite, Graham. Graham! Graham! I was a virgin for a long time, guys. (laughs) (laughs) That's not my fault. Like I said, I was 
This is, I'm here to do a confession. I'm here to do a confession. So the last girl I had sex with started to cry. This isn't even comedy, it's the truth. In the middle of it, she started to cry. And I learned something. I, I, I learned something. I don't know, I'll admit this people, I don't know what the right thing to do is in that situation. I don't know what the right thing to do is. But I did learn the wrong thing to do is keep going. I learned that that day. Thank you. Thank you. It's a Thank you. Great stuff. I don't know why. Well done. Well done. The whole thing is still bad. All right. So that was uh, Dave Chappelle talking about Graham K in New York City. And we're going to do this thing now. Uh, it's time now for another installment of a brand new segment we introduced last episode uh, called Are You Mariah or Yoko? And now, Julian Dion presents Are You Mariah or Yoko? Where we find out from each of your celebrity guests, is it vocal range or vocal strain? Okay, I'm here once again joined with uh, Jen Grant. Hello. If, if you could uh, just quickly explain the segment Kay. to the listeners. Okay, well, you know when you listen to music with your earbuds and you get really into it and you're singing, like say in your car or at home alone, and you're really, really singing it and you feel like you sound just like the person you're listening to, but you're hearing their voice, so you actually probably don't sound that good. Well, we're going to test this theory right now. With Graham, he's going to be a good sport and play this game with me. So I'm going to start, and we're going to sing uh, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. And Julian's going to decide who's the best out of the two of us. We can't hear ourselves. And enthusiasm counts for something. So if you really sell the shit out of this song, Mm -hmm. that will go a long way. Okay, so again, they can't hear themselves. They can only hear the music, and we can't hear the music. We just hear their voice. Oh, I'm nervous. Okay. are you Mariah or Ah. Yoko? And the first contestant up, Jen Grant, Otis Redding. Here we go. (laughs) Okay. Sitting in the morning sun. I'll be sitting when the evening comes. Watching the ships roll in. Then I watch them roll away again. Yeah, I'm sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tide roll away. (laughs) Shut up. (laughs) Sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time. Uh, All right, that was... (laughs) Was it terrible? No, it was fine. It was... it was fine until the very end when it was terrible. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but the first the first 30 seconds I was like, "Oh, here we go." You know? And then it got to it got to the hard part where I'm going to screw up. Uh, yeah. That's I'm don't worry, I'm not better than you. It's embarrassing. Why? Yeah, why? It'd be a, more embarrassing by the morning. Hold on, let me yeah, I should, you just that up. <laughs> okay, so that was Jen Grant's submission. Uh, Ari Mariah Yoko, here we go with uh, Mr. Graham K. <clears throat> sitting in the morning sun, I'll be sitting when the evening comes, watching the ships roll in, then I watch them away again, yeah. Sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tide 
I'd roll away. Ooh, and sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time. <laughs> I left my home in Georgia, or headed for the Frisco Bay, cause I got nothing to live for, and I got nothing gonna come my way, yeah, oh, sitting around my bay, watching the tide roll away. Woo! I'm sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time. Oh, God, that was Graham K. I don't know what I sounded like this. That was pretty terrible, but funny. Really? Yeah. Sitting on the dock of the bay. sounded like an 80 year old man. Did it sound racist? <laughs> <laughs> Looking back on it. But that's uh, that's the beauty of it. Okay, well, geez, it's, this is going to be a tough one to call. I think I'm going to have to say Jen started off as Mariah, but right. slipped into some Yoko there. Oh, and um, Graham, I'd have to say that was pretty much straight Yoko through. Really? All the way. <laughs> really? I mean, the I effort to was there. Play back that audio for me after, because <laughs> in my ear. Pretty dead on. Oh, uh, shit. Yeah. Anyway, so I'd, I'd call this one a... Uh, I'm going to give it up to Jen, I think. Give it to Jen. I mean, if you thought I was all Yoko, I'm I mean, sure. let's... Just the half. The yeah, half. the first half was pretty good. That you A half beats nothing. Uh, yeah, you're but right. But I also think that but you had prejudice the inf- uh, <laughs> against black people. And you <laughs> thought I was black because you closed your eyes for one second. You uh, you had the enthusiasm in there. You got into character, so that's that's worth something to you. But I'm gonna give it to uh, Jen, so oh that my God. I know. Oh, good for you. That's awesome. Yeah. You made up the segment. So once again, that was Are You Mariah you have to, or you have to make Yoko? Up a prize for you to win now. <laughs> All right. I like so, having fun with my friends. Yeah. There we go. Put those cans back on. Hey there. Mm. Shit. Oh, okay. So we talked a little about your time in New York, and now you're here in Toronto. Sure. You've been here for three years. Yeah, three years. Three years. And uh, you've been doing uh, very well for yourself in your native country. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm leaving. You're leaving. You have an O1 o- o- visa. We have a one-way ticket to L.A. You're going to L.A. this time? Yeah. Going on the left coast? I'm going to try it out. When are you going down there? January 17th. Nice. Yeah. Cool. And uh, figuring out what to do with the lady, trying to bring her down. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Big big kerfuffle. Big kerfuffle. Yeah. How is she going to do that? Uh, Well, I don't know. She'll uh, It sucks. The logistics. Quit her amazing job. Her and, amazing job. She's yeah. so smart. Mm-hmm. And uh, so talented, and she has so many connections, and I'm going to ask her to stop all of that. She's a fitness instructor, right? No. <laughs> no. Uh, she's, a, she's a publicist. And, um, but, you know, she, you, there's, there's jobs like that in, in L.A., so yeah. we'll figure it out. You figure know? it out. We'll It'll figure all out. work out. Yeah. But it's such b- bullshit, the logistics for Canadians to move down to the States, like... Mm-hmm. It's beyond frustrating and expensive. And it's frustrating uh, considering that they just they complain when they come to like just for laughs, and then the border border guards like, um, "What are you doing in Canada?" And they're like, "What? Just let me go." Yeah. What's with all the questions? <laughs> I'm like, "Do you know what I have to go through? Do yeah. they ask you to pay for uh, six thousand dollars for mm-hmm. a lawyer and a one thousand page document to prove that you that you're not a, that you can do comedy?" Yeah. Because that's what I had to do. Yeah. And it runs out, by the way. Yeah. Three. Is it a three year one? Three year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. Congrats on doing that. Thanks. Well, listen, I could talk to you all day. Uh, Jen did it. You're a good guy. Yeah, Jen did it. Jen had the O one, one And, um, but we're all here now. Toronto's Toronto. awesome. I fucking love Toronto it Toronto is so awesome. Yeah. I was talking to an LA-based comedian. Uh, uh, I'll quote him, Ian Carmel. Uh, so funny, so nice, so successful. And he was like, um, if like the top 20 comedians in toronto moved to la 
they would be in the top 100. Right. They would displace 100 comedians. Right, from right. From the top 100 that are there are currently in LA. Right. I was like, yeah, and I qu- I, uh, I I quoted um my uh, I've quoted my friend Eddie Delaseppi who just moved down there, and uh, he's getting like people are like, oh yeah, you do really good, blah, blah. and he's like, he's like, no one knows about us. We're like we're like Cuban baseball players, right? You know, that's twice I've used that quote. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit the first one out, so this one's well, whatever. <laughs> I stole it from Eddie the first time, right. but uh, <laughs> like it's so true. We're really funny up here. It's a great scene, mm-hmm. and I love the city. I love living it's a in great Canada, city. Yeah. and I love Toronto. It's such a great city. I was so scared about moving here from New York. I thought it was going to be a small, gray, boring city, and it's so awesome here. It's mm-hmm. like if the best parts of Brooklyn took over all of New York. Right. If Brooklyn just took over New York, right? You know, and it's just cool. Yeah, you had never lived here before. No, I had never yeah, been here before. Same here, and uh, I just had some trepidation and same sort of thought process. Yeah. But I moved and instantly fell in love with it, and it it, it keeps growing on me. I yeah, just I me just too. love uh, the city. Th- so Toronto, thank you. Mm-hmm. I guess. And uh, what else can we say? Oh, sports bras on um, Sirius. Uh, we were on Sirius. We got kicked off Sirius. Uh, got kicked off. Yeah. Why? We just didn't have the right... We weren't on the right channel. We were on, like... Uh, first, we were on Canada Laughs, and then we were on Canada Talks. And we were, like... We didn't want to move to Canada Talks, but they just... Why did they move you? Because wasn't... they had, like, scheduling. They had, like, or like TSN Hockey, or Hockey Night in Canada Radio. Right. I had to move. It just didn't work out. Like, mm-hmm. there was, like, bigger fish right. on Canada no, Canada Laughs, um, what am I talking about? Canada Laughs, there was other, I don't know, it just didn't work out scheduling-wise. They wanted right. to switch us to an hour, and we were doing half hour. Mm. And so in order to do an hour, they, they made us move to Canada Talks. We didn't want to do an hour, but we did it anyway. And we are le- we were like leading into like, you know, some lady talking about frying pans or something. Mm. You know, just like, yeah. you know, it's boring talk radio. And we're like... Pretty cutting, I don't want to say, pretty edgy, like, sports jokes. And, like, not, not like, like we're saying some per- kind of racy things. You know right. what I mean? And we're not swearing, but we're, you know, saying our minds and calling people idiots and calling people racists and calling people pedophiles and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it's just, and now uh, Bob and Suzanne talk about uh, how to make a good garden. It is the next yeah. one, you know. Yeah, yeah. It just didn't work out, and right. now we're we're we're, we're, a, we're a podcast and uh, sport bras, uh, the sport bras b r a h s dot com. And uh, how do they? So you do your podcast. Do you submit to be on XM, or do they find you? Or we asked. For you sure. asked, yeah. and then do they pay you to do that, or is that a free spot? XM, um, they give you all the advertising revenue, or like they give you like. Uh, not the all. Uh, they give you like fifty percent of the advertising revenue, right? And which is nothing, right? So, because they get all their money from subscribers. Mm-hmm. All right, and I so think I made a chocolate bar. <laughs> well, there, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it was a payday. <laughs> all right, brother. Well, um, I'll have you back because there's so much uh, I want to talk to you about. And Hopefully, uh, I survive uh, the walk through the hallways of this building. Walk. Th- oh yeah, I yeah. wanted to talk about that. Okay, before we go, what, you came into here uh, to Lemon Press Studios, and you said that you, you, someone tried to kill you in this building. What's, what's that about? No, no one tried to kill me in this building. Somebody who lives in this building right. uh, sent me death threats via text message. I have a, I have a, a mentally ill friend. And uh, and it, and and, then I, and this sort of just all happened like last last Tuesday and uh, and then, oh shit and then fresh I, and I biked up to this building and I was like oh, f- oh man he lives here <laughs> and yeah so can you talk about it well I mean uh, it's just um, I have. Uh, I have a, a friend and uh, and uh, just a great, smart, intelligent, kind, 
beautiful guy and something you know mental illness is a bitch yeah you know what i mean and uh something's got a hold of him and i'm trying to figure out what to do so no- nothing happened to, for him less to of tr- a funny story and more of a sad story i think <laughs> so <laughs> i don't know how well, i'm trying to get on canada it. talk so yeah uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah i so it just basically long story short is like somebody was like uh no like just crazy like just like you're i mean like i'm gonna beat the shit out of you blah 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 and you're gonna break your jaw in half and you know and 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 uh saying some pretty heavy stuff other than that and uh that happened a couple of days ago and i pulled up to this building uh and i was like oh because this is like like a bunch of lofts like cool yeah. studios or mm-hmm. whatever and um and he lives in one of these cool studios i guess and uh and I've been to his apartment. It's right downstairs. And this just happened out of the blue. Like nothing triggered it. It was just sort of random. He came to my show and it's just, uh, I'm at one of my JFL 42 shows and was acting, I don't know. It's, uh, I don't want to get too into it because I yeah. don't want anyone to put two pieces together. And then right, it, right. It, you know, he gets named or whatever. Yeah. Because I would hate that, mm-hmm. you know, because he's a really good guy. Right. And he's going to get out of this and uh, everything's going to be great. But, you know, well, life's weird. And uh, yeah, so just, life's uh, weird. You're a big man. Uh, thanks for doing this. Any plugs? Um. Uh, the, uh, the the just go to the if you if if you like sports at all, um, go to the sportbras.com. Um, it's a really funny show. We're trying to make it into a TV show. Um, and I think that's it. I, I'm on Twitter. Um, I know that's cheesy for a comedian to say. But I, I don't care. I desperately need you to follow me on Twitter. It's at Graham K. Comedy. K is spelled K-A-Y. Graham K. Comedy. So that would be great. And your website, Comedy by the Graham, which go check out that sexy photo I shoot. don't want you to, It's such a cheap... It's old <laughs> pictures, and they're so corny. And Well, one of them is anyway. It's like... like <laughs> it's like a sexy shot, and I look like... Like, mm, come watch me be funny and fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I look like a huge wiener. It's so embarrassing. I like it. I like it. Hold on, let me pull it up here. Oh, no. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Look into my eyes. Ooh. Yeah. I'm, gonna I'm go. conceited. I'm Click. Gonna <laughs> 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 I'm going to go do a comedy set and then go pose for GQ. I look like a dink. I like it. Anyway, buddy, Graham K., thank you so much for dropping in and doing this. I appreciate it, and I'll see you around and uh, watch your head. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Uh, You guys are the best. Right on, man. Well, there we are, episode number four. Thanks again for listening. Yeah. Here's to you. Thanks to my producer, Mr. Adam Fox, my sound engineer, Miles Lacroix. Thanks to my guest, Graham K. Once again, please, if you could, do me this favor. Go to iTunes and comment and rate this podcast. It helps out more than you know. And also check out facebook.com slash jdcomedyhour. Follow on Instagram and Twitter. Twitter? Twitter. I'm learning language, as my friend Graham said. We're getting getting to know the words. It's Facebook, or sorry, Twitter, Instagram, at JD Comedy Hour. Go to jdcomedyhour.com. Yeah, that's right. And uh, thanks again. W- what else can I say? Mom, I love you. Of course. I'm going to go get some sleep now. I'll be sleeping by the time you listen to this. No matter how far into the future you do listen to this, I'm asleep right now. I'm going to go try to buy a Nutribullet, a new one, and get some sleep. Thank you, everybody, from Lemon Press Studios. Watch your head.
me, me, me. Might as well do it right. Do it That's right. What you're doing. Do it right. Do yeah. it right. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, too loud. It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Yeah, it's better. Hello. I don't need it so loud in the cans. Hello. Yeah, hi. Is that better? Yes. This is my broadcasting voice. See, my guest today, see? Sounds like Dan Natterman. All right. Is Dan that? Natterman. Preface it. My doctor said, there's a commercial said, why don't you ask your doctor?